Hi, uh, my name is Peter Kuriyama, and I'm a graduate student at the University of Washington, advised by Trevor Branch. And the title of my talk is Incentivizing Selectivity in the West Coast Groundfish Fishery. Um, and this is part of a larger Sea Grant funded project um, looking at the economic and social effects of cat shares in the West Coast Groundfish Fishery. And before I get started, I'd like to acknowledge Kate Rutherford from DFO in Canada and Marlene Bellman from the Northwest Fishery Science Center for providing a lot of the data that I've used in my analyses. Um, and here's a picture of me, because I was instructed to include one in my title slide. Um, so I'll start with an overview of the West Coast Grand Fish Fishery, in which, which is a multi-species fishery, and about 29 stocks are managed currently. Um, both valuable and overfished species are caught together, and these overfished species are hard to avoid. And the fishery spans from Washington to California, so it's a fairly large geographic area. And in the, in the fishery, there are kind of two categories of species. The first is target species, which are targets because they're valuable, and people want to eat them. They're fairly easy to market. Um, and some examples are petrali sole sablefish and Pacific whiting. And on the other hand, there are constraining species, which are stocks that are overfished and rebuilding for a number of reasons. A lot of it comes back to their biology in that they're long-lived, they're slow-growing, and late to mature. And so some examples of these are canary rockfish shown in the top left. Um, when they're brought up from depth, they kind of bulge out because the pressure is so low. Um, so that's what's shown here in yellow, yellow eye rockfish below. And I think a lot of the challenges in managing U.S. fisheries comes back to National Standard 1 um, from the Magnuson-Stevens Act. And the Magnuson-Stevens Act is a piece of federal law that governs all U.S. fisheries management. Um, and National Standard 1 states that conservation and management measures shall prevent overfishing while achieving on a continuing basis the optimum yield from each fishery for the United States fishing industry. And the hardest thing about this is what exactly is optimum yield? And a lot of this comes down to your perspectives. And optimum yield becomes even harder to define in a multi-species context, where both target and constraining species are caught together. Um, from an economic perspective, optimum yield is the catch that will maximize your profits. Um, that means that you're going to maximize target catches in general, and um, potentially overfish some constraining species. Uh, from an environmental perspective, optimum yield is the catch that will prevent all overfishing. Um, and that may require foregoing some target catches and in turn some profits to avoid these constraining, sp constraining species. Uh, from a social perspective, optimum yield may be the catch that maintains fishing communities and you're going to have to design uh, specific management um, to ensure that uh, traditional participants in the fishery maintain their rights and that the benefits from fishing are widely dispersed. And this may require not uh, maximizing profits on a fishery-wide scale. Um, and is there kind of a way to optimize yield for these three goals? Um, and I think that cat shares may be the best option available um, for achieving these three. And so cat share systems in general um, take a coast-wide total allowable catch, um, which is set using stock assessments and then dividing and allocating to individuals based on their catch histories. Um, and so fishers in catch share systems have these extended uh, fishing seasons. There's no risk to fish, and then they can trade, lease, or sell their quota in order to meet their catch targets. Um, so how would catch shares be a win-win with regards to um, economic and environmental goals? First is that catch shares will increase profits because um, inefficient fishers will sell or lease their quota. They may decide that they're theoretically better off doing something else. And so it's best for them to sell or lease their quota to better fishermen, more efficient fishers, um, which would lead to increased profits. And one point is that this sort of consolidation would be bad for communities, which is a negative social outcome. And I'll, I'll circle back to this a little bit later in the talk. Um, another way that catchers may increase profits is by providing a, a steady supply of fresh fish to processors. Um, fresh fish has higher prices than canned or frozen fish, and this may trickle back to fishermen. Um, and then catchers from an environmental perspective prevent overfishing by requiring federal onboard observers, um, which enforce the TACs. 
and this transferable quota can provide flexibility for fishermen to maximize catch of target species while avoiding constraining species. Um, and again, catch shares eliminate the race to fish. So in thinking about how a fishery and how fishermen will respond to catch share systems, um, we came up with a couple hypotheses. Uh, the first hypothesis is that catch shares are perfect. Um, fishermen can catch most of the TAC, and this would be seen in catch to TAC ratios increasing for all stocks. Um, the reasons for this is that uh, quota is perfectly transferable and easy to um, transfer among people. And then, there, uh, again, there's this relaxed fishing season and uh, no competition for fishing. And then, so looking at a histogram of catch to TAC ratios uh, with the catch to TAC ratio bins on the x-axis and the percentages in each bin on the y-axis, um, before catch shares, you could start with some distribution. Um, but then after catch shares, everything kind of bunches up towards one. Uh, another hypothesis is that um, acknowledges that we cannot overfish and that these constraining species are going to constrain target and overall catches. So this would be seen with constraining catch to TAC ratios at 1, but then target catch to TAC ratios less than 1. Um, and it would look something like this, where, uh, again, the constraints are up near 1, targets are below, And so what actually happened on the West Coast is not really consistent with either of these hypotheses. Um, so after catch shares, the catch to TAC ratios for um, a handful of target species bunched up near 1, and uh, a lot of the constraining catch to TAC ratios were below 5, or below 0 0.5. So this shows that, um, you know, constraining stocks may be affecting, impacting target catches in a way that kind of we didn't really predict. Um, so I mentioned that, and then uh, we decided to dig a little bit deeper into how exactly constraining species constrain catches. And so to do this, we compared the BC commercial trawl fishery and then the West Coast groundfish fishery. So we think this is a valid comparison because um, the fisheries have a lot of similarities. One is that they both transition from trip limits to catchers. Um, BC in 97, the West Coast in 2011, um, in response to a lot of overfishing and a lot of discarding. Um, they both had similar fleet sizes, deployed similar gear types, um, and were both going after the same target species. Um, and the difference between the two fisheries has to do with the constraining or the choke TACs. Um, and I show a couple here um, from 2011. And so I want to highlight this yellow eye rockfish, um, which is much, much, much lower on the west coast um, than it is in BC. Um, and there are, I mean, there are low TACs in BC, but they kind of don't really constrain catches like 0 0.6 tons of yellow eye does. Um, so for the Quillback, China, Copper, and Tiger quota, or the complex, um, the TAC was one ton, but the recreational TAC was 49 metric tons. So um, it just may be that they don't want the trawl fishery shutting down the recreational fishery. Um, but to dig a little bit deeper into the yellow eye allocations on the West Coast. Um, so here's a histogram of the individual West Coast yellow eye quota allocations um, showing how the 0 0.6 metric tons was divided. Um, for the most part, the 145 quota holders uh, received less than or equal to 5 pounds. Um, some people receive no yellow eye, which may not be that big of a concern depending on where they are on the West Coast. And so comparing the uh, cash to TAC histograms for both the West Coast and the BC fisheries, um, we see kind of some striking differences. Um, the first thing I want to highlight is this kind of gap between 0 0.5 and 1 on the West Coast, which does not exist at all in the BC fishery. Um, and in general, BC has kind of experienced this bunching up towards uh, a cash to TAC ratio of 1, which we expected to see because quota is transferable and um, the other reasons we mentioned, I mentioned before. Um, so maybe this gets back to the weak stock quota in that um, these constraining species are really constraining overall and target catches. 
Um, and this shows kind of the catch of TAC trajectories for each fishery over time, and then the total catch amounts and the coastwide TACs. And so the, the West Coast fishery has in general been caught at about 30%, whereas the BC fishery is a lot better caught, even though the coastwide TACs shown at the bottom are about the same year to year. And so it seems like catchers on the West Coast, at least, are really incentivizing selectivity. Um, so the target species, Petrali, Sol, Pacific Cake, and Sablefish, have catch TAC ratios near 1, um, and everything else is essentially below 0 0.5. And so what these three species have in common is that they're easy to target. Um, they're not typically associated with a lot of bycatch. Um, and so because of this, it seems like we would expect discard rates to decrease, um, which is a positive environmental outcome. And so it seems like discards of unmanaged species have not really changed since cat shares have been implemented, and that's shown in this gray box um, after 2011. Um, and for unmanaged flatfish, the pattern is in general the same. There hasn't been a significant decrease or increase in discard rates. Um, but there has been a, a pretty big and noticeable dis uh, decrease in managed and rebuilding discard rate species. Um, and this is also consistent with both discards of the managed species. Um, And so in general, on the West Coast, discard rates have decreased to from about 40% in 2002 to about 10% now. Um, and then compared to BC in the blue, the decline in discard rates is consistent. And so risk pools can be one way that fishermen can increase catch of target species while decreasing um, catch of constraining or overfished species. And in general, I think risk pools can be thought of as a, a sort of fishing insurance policy. And so a group of fishers will get together, pool their constraining quotas together, um, coordinate their fishing effort, and this may entail um, daily catch updates um, in kind of these both either informal or formal agreements. Um, and there has been a formal risk pool called the Fort Bragg Central Coast Risk Pool in Central California which involves the cities of Morro Bay, Fort Bragg, and Half Moon Bay. And this quota was owned by the Nature Conservancy, and now a majority of that quota is managed and owned by the Morro Bay Community Quota Fund. And this Community Quota Fund um, sets out to maintain kind of these social goals of uh, maintaining traditional fishing communities and uh, dispersing ben fishing benefits um, across a wide swath of the population. Um, but Actually digging into the, the numbers from the risk pools, we would expect that um, we expect there to be an increase in target catch to TAC ratios, while a decrease in constraining catch to TAC ratios. And so here is a plot showing time series of catch to TAC ratios um, with target species on the left side and constraining species on the right side. Uh, the lines are the fishery-wide um, ratios and the dots indicate numbers from the risk pool. And it looks like long spine and sablefish have had increases in their ratios, while um, dark blotched Pacific Ocean perch um, and widow have um, ratios have decreased, which is a, a good result indicating that I think the risk pool is, is working well. And so, in conclusion, um, I think catch shares have incentivized selective fishing on the West Coast. Um, achieved by these low constraining species quotas, and fishermen are selectively catching profitable species. Um, it does appear that overall catch has been constrained, um, and most TACs are 50% caught or less. Um, one caveat is that catch shares have only been in place for two years on the West Coast, and everyone still may be figuring it out. Um, but I think catch shares have effectively um, achieved environmental goal by preventing overfishing, um, and we're still working out the economic and social goals um, with risk pools and community quota funds. Um, and so in closing, I want to thank Sea Grant for providing the funding for this research and look forward to hearing your questions.